Hi everybody, welcome to another Broken Meeple video. As always, remember to leave a thumbs up and comment. I want to hear your thoughts as well. And also, if you want to help this channel run and smoothly, then the Patreon campaign is always there if you want to donate a dollar or two. And we're done with 2021, and blimey, is it, is it me or is this thing just zipped by at this point? You know, at one minute it was 2020, then it was 2021, and my life has certainly been a bit of a roller coaster this year, but uh, I don't know, more detail on that another time. But here, we're to talk about my 10 favorite games of this year, and 2021 has been fantastic for games, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, no it has not. <laughs> Just like 2020, these two last years have been mediocre, I think, for gaming. I mean, it's not to say that there aren't good games released, but in terms of thinking, right, these are 10 that I'm gonna shout, like, the praises of and say these are fantastic, both years don't seem to be meeting the mark quite as well as previous years. I feel like we had a, a run from something like 2012 up to 2016 time, and then since then it's just kind of been petering a bit, and now lately, especially, I mean, maybe COVID was a cause, I don't know, but yeah, the last two years worth of games have just been a bit lacklustre for me. I don't know, maybe I'm just getting more critical. But, you know, there's not to say that there aren't some belters to talk about, and that's what I'm going to do on this list, but other people are out there doing like their top 20 of the year, and it's like, really? Um... If I was to do 20, I'd be scraping the barrel a bit by the time I got near the 20 mark or something. Maybe people are just too forgiving of games. Well, I'm not. That's why you watch me. So, like, like I say, I got 10 good games to talk about. You know, I will talk about which ones didn't make the list at the end. I have, obviously, I have not played every single game from 2020 on, but then again, neither have you. So, you know, it's a case that there's too many games to play. That's why I do a retrospective list in six months time to go over this list again, so that I can not only catch up with games I never played during this year, but also reflect on my thoughts for games that I've put highly on this list. So, like I say, Without further ado, let's get cracking. Get on with it. My number 10 is from AEG and Flat Out Games, and it's a follow-up to a previous hit called Calico. However, I believe Cascadia is a better game overall. The previous one was a push luck game for the most part. It had its thinky moments, but you were very restricted in what tiles you could have. You were building a quilt cover, they had to go in specific points, but it was very much luck of the draw and chaos as to whether you actually got the tiles you wanted. Here in Cascadia, though, you're building a little park with your terrain tiles, and putting tokens of different animals on there. The animals score in different ways, but you have more choices to which you can take from the display, and a separate resource that acts as a kind of mitigation factor for you to choose different tiles and tokens at any one time, rather than a set pair. That's kind of the gist of the game, really. You choose the tiles, you put the tokens on your map, you build up the map of different types of terrain, try to create big areas of desert and water or mountain, but then also setting up the animal tokens in such a way that they score based on their card. You've got four different scoring cards, I think, maybe five even, for each, for each actual animal. Five different animals, good amount of replay value, goes at a quick pace, granted much better as a solo or two player game than it is with a three or four, but it's still, at four players, a fairly quick game and just very light and fun. It looks beautiful, it's got Beth Sobel's artwork all over it, and it's just a nice, smooth, almost zen-like game. Even if it is four players and it might go on a little bit long, I'm just like, you know what, this is just nice. I just want to play a nice game with animals and little pretty pictures. Now, and that's good enough for me. But as a solo game, this works really well too. Very easy system to manipulate. It's just a case of discarding stuff in the display at various times, and you go for these different scenarios with restrictions to try and get a certain amount of points. Very easy, and honestly, it's a quick one for me to just whip out onto the table and play in about 30 minutes whenever I feel like it. It's a solid game all around, definitely kicks like Calico to the curb. This is the one I recommend, Cascadia. My number nine is a relatively new game, and it wasn't even at Essen. Mainly because Asmodee and Repost Production weren't at Essen. So I had to get hold of it afterwards, and then once I got it, it didn't take me long to get a lot of plays of this, because it's super simple, super fast, and decent as well. It's Seven Wonders Architects. This is a spin-up follow-up to Seven Wonders, but they are very different games. It still retains that theme and flavor of Seven Wonders, of building up a civilization, and it still has similar iconography, but the game instead is literally take a thing out of the box, a, a tray out of the box, get your pieces out, done, put your card deck in front of you, then on your turn, draw a card and play a card. From the center deck, or the two decks to the side of you. That's the game. That's literally the turn sequence. 
So simple. I can teach this in less than five minutes, but by the time you've got your trays out, we're already pretty much ready to start the game. It's that fast, but it's really simple. This is definitely the Gateway Seven Wonders game. Seven Wonders is not a gateway game, people, okay? How many times do I have to say this? But with Seven Wonders Architects, it is. I could teach this to just about anybody, maybe not with parents, bless them, but I could certainly teach it to most other people, but it's just a nice, simple, like lightweight game of trying to build up your uh, so like your wonder, but also thinking, well, you know, I'll grab a few science cards and grab some of those abilities. Ah, military. Well, hang on, I'm beating my two side people. If I trigger the war, I get some extra points. And the blue cards are just points. The in, and the resources you need specific ones. Your wonder has a special ability that triggers at various times. It's just very light and breezy. But it's solid. I mean, I can get this game done in 30 minutes tops. I can play it with up to seven players. Granted, like with Seven Wonders, I tend to cap it at about four. But still, I could play it with more players and it would still be fun to play. There's little to no reason you should have any analysis paralysis in this game. It looks great. Yeah, it's a big box, but those trays are really cool. I mean, they have everything you need in that tray. You just give people a tray and that is it. Never need to check the rule book ever again. Never need to look at a setup diagram ever again. It's just that simple. Sitting in my collection, I'm going to try and teach it to the parents, although we'll have to see how well it goes down. But yeah, I take this to game nights just as a thing. Hmm, I'm going to need a lot of new gamers here. I need something. Ah, Seven Wonders Architects. Not a replacement for Seven Wonders, a decent side story. My number eight is gonna shock a few people. Not, I mean, okay, I like heavy euros, people, okay. I don't mind a long heavy euro. But this one, based on who published it and who designed it, you're gonna wonder how on earth did I enjoy this game? It's from the same people who have given me two of my most hated games of the recent years, Lorenzo and Barrage, but this is Golem. Stupid fat hobbit. Golem, not Golem, Mr. Editor. But this is a solid, heavy Euro from Cranio Creations. And I must say, Lorenzo from the same design people, I hate. Barrage, I hate. But Newton is on my shelf down there, along with Golem. And both of these games have got a similar feel in how they work. They're essentially point salads at the end of the day, but you get to pick very different paths in order to decide, oh, I want to get points this way, I want to try this strategy. But they don't feel as restrictive but you still gotta work hard to get your points. And it's all about building comparific turns. In Golem, you have three different streets, your students move along the street to get you income bonuses, but the golems that you have move along the street as well. They activate locations for special abilities, but the golems move of their own accord and your students have to try and keep up pace with them in order to stop them venturing too far off and costing you points and resources until you decide, you know what, whoop, kill the golem and you're good and you get some bonus for that. But the variety in this game is insane. You're selecting your actions by those marbles, the marble system, and I like that mechanic. I mean, great, it's got no theme whatsoever. I mean, come on, what marbles? But it's just a solid system of like, oh, the actions are gonna be different each round, and certain actions are gonna be more powerful than others. I need a specific color marble in order to get the character card at the end of the round. Oh, do I fancy it or should I just skip it? Which student do I wanna move? And then triggering all those different locations with the golems is such a rewarding combo experience. I activate this golem which allows me to do a development at a discount right I'll use this one that gets me this at a discount which allows me to get a book sliding that book in allows me to do this at a di it's just you can create some really powerful turns now it's quite rules heavy it's certainly going to burn the brains of most people who aren't heavy gamers like I don't recommend this to anybody who's not a heavy gamer at all. The theme is kind of disjointed for the most part, you know, it's not really a massive theme, although I do like calling my golem Jeffrey and just sort of sending them out and hoping I don't have to kill him. Like big, good, strong hands. But it's just a very cool Euro game. Yes, it's a point salad, yes, it's dry, but I don't know, there's just something about I, it clicks for me. The, the whole iconography thing, yes, I know there's a lot to learn in that respect, but I still enjoy it. It kind of just works for me. I like going, right, it's, it's an opportunity game. That's what I like. It's not just simply, oh, my strategy is I'm going to level up the blue track as much. Okay, fine, that's your strategy. But then you might get a point during the game where it's like, well, hang on, that rabbi action is now out there, which allows me to move him, which can do this. That will trigger that. Get that book now, which has just come out. Oh, that'd be pretty sweet. And, you know, yes, you can plan ahead for some of these things, but it's just nice to be able to catch those opportunities and go, 
this will be good. Yeah, a really cool rewarding game. It's a table hog. It's a heavy game. I certainly don't want to play this with everybody, but yeah, it's really solid and it sits there alongside Newton. So uh, it goes to show that even some designers and publishers who can make games I despise can still put out games I really like. My number seven was quite a bit of a shock to me actually, mainly because I had played the previous version of this and thought, there's good stuff I like here, but man is this long, and man is it punishing, and man does it look like a dog's dinner on the table. You know, I give it respect, but I probably wouldn't play it again. So when this new version came out, I was like, okay, you know what, a more streamlined version that ups the component quality a little bit, takes out the programming aspect, I might actually like this, because I do think the theme is great. And yeah, it sung for me. Is it perfect? No, there's one or two things I might have to consider house ruling, but you know, I'm not too fussed about that. Dominant Species Marine really worked. I don't like in the original game that you have that programming aspect because it's too punishing. You're playing this three hour game with up to six players, which can take over four hours, which is ridiculous. And then you are expected to program your actions and hope everything goes to plan. Not only does that create so much analysis paralysis that's unreal, but it's also very punishing because you can have turns that out of your control just go to pot and then you're basically stuffed. It's like, well, I just wasted the last half an hour of the game, didn't I? It, you know, those sort of things irk me in that one. Marine, though, gets it right for me for the most part. You know, you remove the programming aspect, it's now essentially an action selection worker placement thing. You go onto the different actions on the spots and they trigger immediately. But you can't go any higher than the previous pawn you left, so you gotta think, well, I wanna do that action, but I also wanna do those two before I refresh. Maybe I should do those first, or am I so desperate for that action that I should get it now? The marine theme works for me. I mean, I'm not too fussed whether I'm a, a lizard or a cephalopod or whatever, but, you know, you know, compared to dominant species, oh, I'm a, what was it? Well, I certainly don't like playing the spiders, and funny enough, I think I actually did play the spiders in my first game. That was a bit weird. But this one, like I say, marine species or land species, whatever. But I love the idea that you are controlling this area, these different areas on the board, scoring at different times, it's very opportunistic, you are definitely in each other's faces, it's a very interactive game. But the card system I also like as well, these cards that give you special abilities as traits at the start of the game, or act as like special like power cards during the game, like you grab one and it triggers an effect and allows you to get some points. I do have to admit, it can get a little swingy at times with that card display, whereas one gets flipped out, suddenly someone grabs it and it's perfect for them. I am going to have to think of a little house rule to get around that. But other than that, other than that blemish, I really enjoyed this one. It's thinky, it's thematic, it's still, like, it's interactive, one of the more interactive Euros out there, but it fixes a lot of the problems that I had with Dominant Species and gives me a very enjoyable Euro. Lots of different actions, lots of different ways to play, the trait cards are going to affect what sort of strategy you go for, and even then it's more of a case of, hmm, how are things looking at the moment? Should I grab that now? Ooh, we're gonna run out of food, I better get some food, but then I really wanna do that. Lots of cool, agonizing decisions without that AP-inducing programming aspect. You know, remove that, fix it with the worker placement action selection, and you've made the game for me. Dominant Species Marine. My number six is a game I haven't really talked about much, other than possibly on the podcast, and I've seen Nobody else talk about it. What what happened? Nobody's what nobody's played it? Nobody's thought it was any good? I'm really confused. I've not seen it on any top ten list anywhere. What's going on? But this from Arcane Wonders is a solid game. Not a lot of people have heard of this one, and it's called Mortem. Who? Mortem Medieval Detective, as it's basically called. This is, well, pretty much as the name suggests, it's the medieval version of Detective. Remember the Portal game, the co-op where you're figuring out the, the like who done it as a, with a card system? Same sort of thing, but set in a medieval time. But here there's a few tweaks that I think I'm not going to say elevate it above detective, they're kind of on par with each other, but they are certainly distinct enough from each other. This one has you taking the role of several characters, and you can pick which characters you want as each like, scenario unfolds and more will come in later, but these characters give you the usual tokens of, oh I get this token with this character, I get money with this character, all of which are useful, and you go through a plot of which you are trying to solve a mystery, you're going to locations, you're talking to 
player, I'm sorry, you're talking to characters, you're doing all these kind of things, and it's done with a card system. So okay, that's the same. Here's a couple of tweaks though. Firstly, this is definitely a challenge. Anybody who's played stuff like Dune House Secrets or Vienna Connection and that and thought, well, this is too easy. Yeah, I dare you to play this and tell me it's too easy. Whoa, you need to have your thinking cap on with this. There's a lot of information in there. You are definitely gonna have to look like in the detail to see what's what, and you are not gonna get through everything you could possibly explore in one playthrough. I dare say you could actually leave this for a period of time, go back to it and get a second playthrough doing a different strategy and you would get a different experience. There really is quite a decent amount of content. On top of that, you also don't have any rule book. Nothing. You literally just open up the first deck of cards, and there you are. It teaches you how to play the game, and you just get going. Oh, that's so rewarding. The fact that you now actually can just get into a game and enjoy it. Finally, you know, I don't have to spend two hours reading the rule book like I had to do with Great Wall. <laughs> More on that later. And, you know, having to try and decipher the game. No, it's just like... Hey, I'm having fun. Nice. But the other thing is the search, raid, and surveillance deck. You have a timer track like in Detective, and you have markers that you can put on it. And what you do is you say, right, well, Assassin, I'm going to flip this character over so his tokens aren't available. But I'm putting his surveillance token on the ruins, and I want you in to survey the ruins. Three hours later, when your timer marker hits that point on the track, you then take a card from a specific deck for surveillance for that location and you read what it says. It could be a red herring, it could be nothing that really happens, or it could be a fundamental inclusion of the plot. There's a deck for those three different things, surveillance, search and raid, uh, one that you can play fairly aggressively, you can play fairly like you know diplomatically with what you do, because raiding is certainly a much more aggressive thing to do than just simply surveying. But I like the fact that you've got those three distinct decks. So if I played the same scenario again, I'd still get a different experience if I just simply chose to search, raid, or survey different locations at different times. You won't be able to do a lot of them because there's a limited supply of tokens, but they refresh every day, so you get to use them several times, and it, it just adds an extra layer of depth to the story and that deduction experience. It really is a solid game, you know, and you know, I'm not going to spoil anything plot-wise, but I found the story to be good as well. Uh, the artwork is really nice in it, and yeah, it's just a solid package that no one is talking about. But seriously, if you like the detective games, if this, if you like into the time story stuff, then by all means, give Mortimer a look. So for my number five, we have a smaller game this time, a follow-up to one of my favorite two-player games of all time. Like, this always goes in the bag if I'm teaching someone new two-player games. This is called Geisha's Road from Emperor S4. I nearly said Han Hanabakoji then, but Hanabakoji is the previous game. Geisha's Road is the follow-up. This one takes that same mechanic from Hanabakoji with the cards and the different, well, in a different geisha what you're trying to influence and adds a rondelle mechanic and makes it more thinky and i still think hanamakoji is the superior game of the two but this is still a really good follow-up it definitely is like the advanced version of hanamakoji if you thought that one burnt your brain and geisha's road seriously will burn your brain not only have you got to do the card system with the geisha to go right well who am i going to influence who is actually like who have i got control of but the points that they score is depending on what happens on the rondelle system where when you play a card they move that many spaces around the ring, you're trying to get the geisha to land back on their original building that they came from, and this generates points that they're worth. But the person who gets the points is the person who wins influence over the geisha on the other side. So it's like you're playing two separate mini games, except the cards you play influence both. Wow, does it burn your brain. I mean, really burn your brain. But it's great. It's not a difficult game to teach. You've even got a little module you can throw in for added depth if you really need it to basically pick up these little, uh, eight, well, I'm trying to think, ages, like VIPs effectively, collect sets for different points. So you've got different ways to score, different things to aim for. But, oh my word, the decision space in this is crazy. That same idea of I've got these four action tiles and I need to figure out a way to how to use them. It's like, oh, which order do I do them in? And some people have done this, and I didn't think of it before, but you could get the expansions to Hanamakoji and use them in Geisha's Road as well. There's technically nothing that says you can't. Granted, that would probably be insane in terms of what like it does to the balance of the game, but it's something I wouldn't mind trying at some point. But no, even on its own, it's beautiful, looks great, cheap, it's just a really solid game all around. Definitely one for the Hanamakoji fans, it's just not probably going to replace Hanamakoji, but it will sit alongside it on my shelf as kind of the advanced version for when I need it.
Right, for number four, I was previously talking about a really good looking game. Uh, let's go for the opposite of that one. I mean, not to say the artwork's horrible, but it's not great, but when we're talking component quality, oh my god, this has got shoddy component quality. It does look like she was beaten with an ugly stick. However, it's not that that's keeping it on this list, obviously. It's the gameplay. This is a really unique deck builder, a very surprise hit for me. I wish it was a bit shorter. I do have to house rule the length down a bit, and I certainly pretty much refuse to play this on anything above two players, unless I trust the people I'm playing with. But this this is Imperium from Osprey Games. This takes my one of my favorite genres of deck building, but throws, again, another interesting twist. This is what you gotta do with your games publishers. Try something new, and designers as well. Try something new, try something innovative, even if it's taking something that's already in existence and throwing a twist on it. Most of my favorite games do that. But with this, you have the deck buildy side, but you choose a faction from history. You know, the, uh, uh, well, I'm trying to, trying to think of the, the Celts or the Romans, you know, the Byzantians. And each one has their own deck of their own unique cards. But there are other cards from the display that you can buy during a game to bolster your deck. But there's multiple ways to win. Do I, un, you know, do I completely drain the king's pile and get those cards? Do I build all my developments? Do I do, do I cause a revolt and end the game early? There's lots of different ways that you can play the game based on which faction you pick and each faction could be played one of two different ways but each one certainly has its own quirk but the uniqueness factor of this game really works you play the romans you are playing a fundamentally different style of game to playing say the arthurians you know some of them have got unique winning conditions that they're aiming for totally different from the others when you combine both sets together i think you've got legends and i forget what the original one's called one's called legends and one's called something else uh, it might be classics and put them together you've got so many different factions it's re it's crazy now granted pretty much want to play this solo only unless I trust the people I'm playing with because it does go on a bit long and you probably are going to want to house rule the length a little bit go on board game geek and find out some things on that I do wish it was a bit shorter which is why it doesn't go any higher on this list and I certainly wish the component quality was better sorry Osprey but it just has to be said but honestly the game itself from a mechanical perspective and from a replay value perspective is really good fun. Really do enjoy this one, as do a lot of solo gamers out there. Nice little twist on deck building, Imperium. It was really hard to call my two and three. My two and three were difficult to, hmm, which way around do I go for it? And honestly, they could change at any point in the future. It was that hard. But this is a pretty early game this year, actually, because a lot of these games have sort of been played in the last few months. This one, on the other hand, was all the way back in January, February time, I think I played this one and leaned it into March because, well, you do play this game for a good 15 to 20 hours. It does take a while to get through the whole game. Yeah, it is Ryan Lockett's Sleeping Gods. Sleeping Gods is this great adventure game, uh, follow up to near and far, but distinct enough from it. And this is like the ultimate do what you like sandbox adventure game. You basically just get told, well, we're in some mystical place. So uh, what do we do now? whatever you like. You can choose whatever direction on the map you want to go once you've got out of the starting area, which is a little bit rinse repeat, but even then there's a few bits I haven't done in there yet. But then you decide, well, where do I want to go? Well, last time I went left and I had all these different plots unfold. You know what? Next time I'll go right. Completely different locations. Uh, maybe I'll go south next time. Completely different locations. There is so much content in this game. It you know, like we're talking Gloomhaven levels of content here, and you can do what you like. Somebody might say, you should totally go to that island. It's got a mystical statue and a golden egg that you should totally find. You're like, nah, I'm going to go over here and check out this uh, like big marketplace and see if I can find some cool stuff there. You know, you can decide what to do. It's, uh, it's like a... It's like the most flexible DM in the world. Most RPGs, the DM is kind of like, you know, you go through this door into this dungeon. It's like, nah, I'm going to go through this uh, bun over here. Oh, you hit a slide that takes you to the same dungeon. It's like, well, yeah, it's the same thing. This one is literally, do what you like. You want to go this path? Fine. You don't want to? Fine. We'll just scrap that bit of the plot. You know, we'll have this bit of the plot instead. It's a well-prepared DM, basically. But... Playing this solo or even with a group is still fun. I like playing it solo personally. I control the nine different characters with their various abilities and tokens that I use. You've got the different items you can find, but the writing is so good here. There's some great little plot threads that you go through. It's nice and simple, not stupid amount levels of exposition, but it's just great 
the story you tell. Strange women lying in ponds. It's got a cool little combat system with like trying to like fill out specific parts on the enemy cards in order to stop their counter attacks. It's just looks gorgeous. Ryan Lockett's artwork perfect. It's just a really cool game. I suppose the problem with this is that it's hard to get it to the table because obviously you need to play it for a lot of time as it is with campaign games. But when I played through it, I had a great time and I look forward to the point where I can play through it again. And that's the hallmark of a game, a great game where you play it and you'll want to play it again as soon as possible. Of course, time permitting, but as I say, still on my shelf and I look forward to that point. Sleeping Gods, my free. My number two just edges out Sleeping Gods, but honestly, I can't even remember why it does. I mean, both of them scratch a similar itch for me. This one, though, has really surprised me. I didn't think I would like it as much as I have been, but so far, and I granted I have not played through the entire campaign yet, you know, I have other things to do, <laughs> but, you know, I don't have all the time in the world to play these campaign games all the way through that fast. But this one is just really working well. A dice manipulation puzzle based off a game that's already on my shelf. The... Ch the this is how I want a choose your own adventure style to be. That is role player adventures. Role player adventures has you going through this big plot with lots of different scenarios, each of their own map and multiple locations and characters to find as you level up your character from a preset one, or if you're really desperate, you can import them from role player, but honestly, that's a little bit too far, especially when you've got like 50 odd characters to pick from. Seriously, do you need any more? But you just pick a character, get your starting cards, and then every time you do a skill check or a combat check, it's based on manipulating dice from a bag. Different colored dice and getting the different values and putting them on the, like, you know, little skill booklet or you've got the enemy card and it'll be like, I need a red two, I need a purple four. Sounds very mechanical and it kind of is, but they're tied to your attributes. So if you're doing a charm test, for example, you're gonna need more purple and white dice because that's your charisma and your wisdom dice. So it does make sense sort of from a thematic perspective, the numbers don't in any respect, but then you're using cards in your hand to go, well, hang on, if I turn that into a five, I can then make it, flip it on its head and make it a two. Uh, if that is a six, I can change it to any color I like. Well, there's a six there. What if I change that to purple? Then I can put it on that spot. That will get me some XP. Um, but how am I going to figure this one out? Oh, I need to... I um, I wait, if I play those cards, again, it's just a really cool little puzzle that repeats itself over and over again with different setups, different levels of difficulty, different types of tests. But my favorite bit is the actual story. Descent Legends of the Dark, for example, really didn't do well on its story. This one, I think it's got a pretty good story so far. And I think the main thing though is just the stuff you do on that story. Not so much the main plot, it's the little side plots you do. In a choose your own adventure book, you'll usually get a scenario and you'll pick A or B and something happens, but then you don't tend to see much repercussions from it. Here, you see the repercussions fast. <laughs> Here, there are so many of these title cards that you grab for doing various things in there. Like, you know, you go, you walk along and you see a guy trapped in a cage, for example, and it's like, hmm, okay, I hear your story. Do I release you or do I leave you there? Whichever one you do gives you a different title and then you find out what that does maybe later in the scenario, next scenario, two or three scenarios down the line. It could take a while, but it's great. So every decision I make feels meaningful. And I dare say I could literally finish this campaign and go through the entire thing again in a different way and get a totally different play style. Choose a character that's more combat -y. I think I'm playing a soothsayer at the moment. And I try to avoid combat if I can. So I'm more diplomatic. I'm more tough and diplomatic as opposed to a big fighter. So I could play through again, play a combat -y character, and then when I come across like big evil dude or whatever, instead of trying to reason with him, I might just decide, you know what, cut your head off. <laughs> and then that will have a very different outcome. Even after only three scenarios, suddenly things were happening that I didn't expect to happen. Like, wow, if I decided to do that instead, this scenario could have ended very differently. It's just really giving me that sense of a start of an old fantasy choose your own adventure book where decisions matter that is something i really respect in any fantasy game with things like descent and a few other ones i never felt like my decisions had long-term effects or really mattered that much here though i do roleplay adventures a solid two 
And my number one game should be, well, no shock to anybody. Come on, you called this. You called this a million years ago, or maybe about a week ago, because I think that was long, as long as I've had since I reviewed this game. Yeah, of course it is. I may have only reviewed it recently, but I've been playing it since, like, you know, the last month and a half. It'll be interesting to see if this game goes up or down when I do my retrospective list, but honestly, I'm playing this again tonight with friends, and I cannot wait. You know, on Tabletop Simulator Mine, I'm still waiting for my pre-order game to arrive, but yeah, I have played this at GridCon, I've played this online, I love this game. As much as I didn't want to sit in a queue for 90 minutes and wait for this game to get one at Essen, I'm really looking forward to getting my copy of Art Nova. Art Nova easily, easily my number one of the year. Like when I came up with this list, it's like, okay, right, let's do the top 10 of 2021. Well, there's Ark Nova. Right, let's think of the rest. It really didn't require much else to think about. Ark Nova, this big, heavy Euro game which kicks terraforming Mars to the curb. <laughs> Although, there are other mechanics that are different from it. But you're building a zoo. Finally, we've got a zoo-themed game after all this time. That actually feels like building a zoo. Each of you has your own little map, which can have asymmetric powers. You've got 250 cards of different animals and sponsors and projects that you can do. So every game will have different stuff come out. So many different paths to victory you can follow. It borrows a couple of other mechanics from Rajas and the Meganges, where you've got the two scoring markers that have to cross. But then it also takes one of my favorite mechanics from another game, Civilization and New Dawn, that sadly has not been used enough, and brings it here, the action row selection mechanic from Civ and New Dawn. Oh, I love that mechanic, where you've got cards on the row, and when you activate the card, it does that action, like build, or animals, or play cards, draw cards, whatever, but the strength of the action depends where it is on the row. Once you use it, it goes to the back of the row, the other shift up, and then it's a case of, well, if I spam the same action over and over again, it's not particularly powerful. But if I can do other things and plan out the next few turns, eventually that will get powerful enough so that I can use it again. But timing is key. When do I do it? Do I do the action now? Do I do it early? Do I wait? Can I afford to wait? I want that card. It's about to get scrapped. Someone else could nick it. it there's... It's not the most interactive Euro, definitely. You are kind of mainly doing your own thing, but you've got to pay attention to the other players. They could nick the project you need. They could nick the card you need. They could trigger a coffee break before you're willing to do it because you've got too many cards in your hand. So it's not like I'm totally solitaire. It's just that unlike Terraforming Mars, you're not on a communal map, you're on your own map. But as I say, this game completely won me over. I was so like worried, like, oh no, please, come on, please, don't mess up the zoo theme. Please, please, please be good. And it was. Oh man, it was. I fell in love with it like halfway through the game. I'm like, I'm building up my little zoo. And now I'm going to go get some birds. I'm going to get a birdie. I'm going to get a parrot. I get pandered. Oh, I've got a little donkey in my petting zoo. Monkey. Granted, some of that is self-injected because I like animals, but still, it just... It really helps. The theme is strong in this one. Not super dripping strong, okay? Yes, you are playing cards and you're getting effects and lots of icons, but you know, the abilities are named after characteristics of the animals like flocking and snapping and flight and all this lot, which is quite a nice little twist. The rules, there's a fair amount to learn, but the game feels intuitive. Stuff makes sense. Like, oh, those are the icons for that. That's the icons for that. I need an enclosure this big to fit a giant bear in it. That kind of makes sense. You know, things just work nicely because the theme is more relatable than terraforming Mars, for example. But, ah, oh, love this. I've played this with people. Yes, it's a long game. Definitely long, particularly with four players. I would rather cap it at three, but you never know. Two player works great. I've played it solo. And the solo's great. You literally have this tiny little tile to micromanage in terms of your game length, but other than that, you basically have to make certain you, your, your two markers cross before the end of the game, and you can do what you like with all the cards and just have fun with it. Oh, it's so good. I don't know when we're getting it in the UK. Rumors are by the end of December, we'll have our copies in on pre-order, but even if I gotta wait till Jan, Feb, whatever, I'm, I'm not expecting it to be instant, but cannot wait to have this in my collection. It's so good. You know, do I regret not waiting for 90 minutes to get it? No, because I don't like queuing, but I certainly cannot wait to get my own copy of this. Tabletop Simulator will have to deal with me for this much. So yeah, my number one, Art Nova. So there you go, Whew. my top 10 favorite games of 2021. And like I say, a lot of these games I really want to sing the praises about, but saying that, 
there was only a couple of games on this list I rated a 10 this year. And even then, one of them has kind of dropped to a 9 now. It's really, Ark Nova was the main one that I would still keep a 10 out of 10. The rest of them didn't even get that high. There's a few 9s, but then there's 8s on here. And if we went into the 20, we'd be getting into 7s. And that's not to say those games are bad, but they've got flaws, they're, they're good, but they're not great. So, do I really want to say that they're my best of the year? And when I've looked at other people's top 10s, I'm like, you like that game? Huh? Really? That's the one we're going for? I don't know. Like I say, different strokes for different folks. But I listed out a ton of games here on my phone here. So I'm just going to go through a bunch that didn't make the list, all right? That very quickly and say why. So The Great Wall. Great Wall, solid game at three players. And only three players. The rule book is atrocious. It looks fantastic. The solo mode is a bit of a faff to work with and really hard. The co-op mode is damn near impossible. Four players, it goes on insanely long. Two players could work fine, I guess, but I don't get the game to the table with two players, really. It's, so it's basically a three-player game for me. And people are giving this a nine out and a half out of ten, nines out of ten. It's like, seriously, when a ton of the content is not that great, nine out of ten? Hmm, I don't know. It's, a, it's not that it's a horrible game, but uh, it's a very restricted game as to who and when I'm going to get it played. Uh, let's see, Meadow. Meadow, decent game. I think I gave it a 7. It looks very pretty. A little bit chaotic with too many players. I just don't quite get why you would have to get those little park tiles that you got to get, the little border things, the hedgerows, in order to get certain other cards. Because it's like, why don't I just continue taking cards off the board? That would get me just as many points. But nice little neat game. It just wouldn't be top 10 material. Hadrian's Wall, still not played, but everybody keeps going on about this game, but I don't know if I want to play Roll and Write Spreadsheet the game. It just doesn't seem like it would be my thing, but if I get a chance to play it, I will. Uh, let's see, some of them I haven't been able to play because of um, stock issues, so I haven't yet played Dixit Stellar, or the new Dune game, or Shinkansen, or whatever it's called, the one about the Japanese uh, Olympic train that you build. Unfortunately, stock couldn't get given to me until... Well, I'm still waiting for it, actually, as they still haven't delivered, but they will be getting played soon, and I will be doing reviews on them, so don't worry. Uh, they just didn't make it in time for this list. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Messina, 1347. Good game. I gave it a solid rating. It would make by 11 to 20. It just, like, it looks a bit drab. I am starting to notice a bit of rinse-repeat re repetition in there. There's not a lot of different paths to victory you can really go for, and it is a very dry affair. So, like I said, it's a good game. It just wouldn't make my top 10. Uh, Brew, nice little game, nice little solid game. It's in my collection for the moment, but I wouldn't put it top 10. Uh, Cryo, Cryo I've only played a couple of times. Uh, this one from Luke Laurie, solid game, but uh, the problem is, is that it literally is a very linear game. I don't feel like there's really any path to victory at all other than do what you're supposed to do, which is get your people underground. Trying to do any other means of getting a lot of points will just result in you losing. So... I enjoy it, but I would only really want to play it once every now and again because it's so linear. And so that's not going to be top 10 material. Uh, Brian Boro, I've been playing that a bit recently. Good solid trick-taking game with area control, controlling Ireland. And it's got some very neat mechanics in it, and I love the trick-taking part of it. I do wish it looked a little better in, ter in terms of its like artwork and that. And certainly it's difficult to get this played with casual gamers because you kind of need to know what you're doing in this. But it's a solid game. I think this would make my 11 to 15 at this rate. It definitely gives me certain vibes to The King is Dead. But yeah, just not top 10 material. But 11 to 15, I can see this being. Uh, Vienna Connection. I gave this one a 9 when I first played it. It's probably on reflection more of an 8. And I really enjoyed this one. But yeah, there's not really any challenge to the game. I just really like the setting and the detective style game. Probably 11 to 15 as well. Uh, Mandala Stones, decent, decent little abstract game, probably in my 15 to 20. It's a good game, I just wouldn't necessarily play it all the time, although you do need to house rule that stupid rule about when you take tiles off the corners when you place the thing down. God, the way the rule book explains it is so stupid. Uh, let's see, uh, Coca Pelli. Finally, a Stefan Geld game I can actually say I like. You know, that one, decent, solid card game, but. Doesn't get played as often compared to a lot of other games, but it's got a lot of variety in it, and I like the mechanics involved. This would probably be a 15 to 20 game. Okay, uh, what have we got? Uh, Die of the Dead. Yeah, Die of the Dead. Nice little uh, chucker, light-hearted roll and um, not roll and right. You know, dice rolling game of putting the dice into coffins and trying to get them up the Day of the Dead ladder. It's it's a nice game and it looks cool, 
But uh, like I say, it's waned a little bit for me over time. It would probably be somewhere like a 20 to 25 game, I think. Uh, Picture Perfect I've been playing recently. Solid little game. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's going to get a review, but it's cool. Nice little party game. It's got a very unique theme. It's not quite as much of a barrel of laughs as I was hoping, but uh, yeah, it's decent. Uh, let's see, Botoku, yeah, check out my review for that one, that was average at best, I mean, overhyped like crazy because it was a long game that looked pretty, but it's super dry, it's a massive faff, the rulebook is atrocious, it is a three hour game of just literal point salad every single time, it, yeah, really didn't work for me that one. Uh, crew Mission Deep Sea doesn't really count because it's just basically the crew, part two. And Maglev Metro, I was meh. I was kind of meh on that one. I mean, uh, the components are cool, but you know, some of the past to victory was a bit unbalanced. Like literally, you should do it this way in order to win. Nothing much else. And it's a train game. I don't go much. Like I said, I thought it was okay, but not that much into it. And yeah, you know, there's a lot of other games this year that have come out that I've just not been as keen on. But then I'm seeing some really obscure stuff from other people. You know, Ark Wright the card game has appeared on some lists. It's like, really? I got no interest in the original Ark Wright, let alone Ark Wright card game version. It's just, there's a lot of games out there. And as I say, there's a lot of stuff I haven't played either. And I hope to play more of them as we go into 2022. Because as always, the first three to four months of a year is always pretty much devoid of board games or any noticeable ones. So this will be the time when some Kickstarters start arriving from for next year. But also when I can go, you know what, let's catch up on a few. Like I've not played uh, Bad Company. And apparently a lot of people seem to be rating that pretty highly. Uh, the Dice Tower on their top 10 recently kept talking about one called, uh, oh, what was it called, Vagrant something? Uh, oh, I forget what it was. It's got like a train on the cover with lots of little blue wisps flying around. I forget what it was called, but I'd never heard of the game. But it sounds cool from what they described. Sounds like something I would really like. I'll have to try and look for a copy of that at some point. So, as I say... Different strokes, different folks. We can't play every single game. I'm just telling you that out of all the games I have played for 2021, these are my 10 favorites. So anyway, that's it for me on this top 10. Will there be other content before Christmas? I don't know. I mean, there's probably a podcast episode. I don't know if this will come out before or after that. I'm not going to do too much content before Christmas because I've got to sort out uh, recruitment issues at the moment so I you know I'm, I've got a few things going on in my life that are taking up my time but also I do need to take a break at some point there might be the occasional live stream that I'll do over the Christmas period but I am going home to visit the family so that's definitely going to take up some time where I'm doing no blogging whatsoever but 2022 should be able to hit the table hit the road going strong um, in January to bring out more content obviously collaborations are going to come back I've taken a bit of break from those for now because people are kind of dealing with Christmas at this point but once we're into January I hope to team up with a few more content creators and do some more top 10s obviously my normal top 10s will resume there's more reviews to come out I just mentioned three of them that I'm going to be doing yep there's oh yeah and even then I'm supposed to also look at the only timer expansion at some point and of course I need to do a review for Brian Borough at some point so there's more stuff on the horizon please be patient but for now whether I see you again before Christmas or not, have a great Christmas and a Merry New Year. So until next time, thank you for watching this video. If you like what you see, please remember to leave a thumbs up and comment so I can read what your thoughts are on these games. What is your favourite game of 2021? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, you can check out more content on the channel, including the review for Ark Nova, so you can hear my detailed thoughts as to why I love the game so much, but also check out my review for Imperium that I did earlier in the year, so you can find out more about why what I thought of that game as well. So take care and remember as always, it's only a game whether it's for Christmas or not. Take care and bye for now.